always accepting donations. To donate, you can go to the website at templeafrictv.com and then you click on the homepage and then click on PayPal donation. And you can make your donation there. You could also call in and make a donation. The number is 612-804-0295. I cannot tell you how grateful we are for your donation. Please take the time and check out the website and feel free to donate to this wonderful service that Tempo Free continues to offer us abroad and at home. All this information is on the website. Just go to TempoAfricTV.com and you will get more information. Thank you very much. C'est encore Yves Kenao. C'est toujours Yves Kenao qui revient. Cette fois-ci, pour vous dire que Tempo Afrique TV vous offre plus de 4000 chaînes de télévision. Les chaînes européennes, les chaînes américaines, les chaînes asiatiques, les chaînes africaines. À un prix imbattable. À un prix imbattable. Tenez-vous bien. 185 dollars pour 12 mois inclut le box. Alors, où est-ce que vous pouvez trouver mieux que ça si ce n'est pas sur Tempo Afrique TV Mesdames, Messieurs, appelez seulement le 612-804-0295 et vous serez servi. Vous serez agréablement surpris de voir plus de 4000 chaînes de télévision rouler sur votre écran comme ça et vous choisissez laquelle vous voulez. Alors, Mesdames, N'hésitez pas. N'hésitez surtout pas et ne vous faites pas compter. Prenez votre téléphone, prenez le tout de suite et appelez le 612, le 804, le 02 95. Nous sommes là, ici à Tempo TV, pour rendre votre vie simple et agréable. Alors, saisissez l'occasion de 185 dollars pour toute une année. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bolo, and thank you for being here with me. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am from Senegal and uh, I am a nurse practitioner. And um, bear with me and know that, um, I'm, I'm hearing myself. <laughs> bear with me and know that this is my first time doing this. I am a little bit nervous, but we're gonna do this. And I also have my phone with me because I have to, uh, follow the questions and the program through my phone, and also uh, I, I'm gonna try to share this on my page because there are so many people that are listening that are gonna be on my page. Um, so uh, let me see if I can, sh if I see the live so I can share. my wall or share it where everybody can see. So uh, to talk a little bit about me, my name is Bolo. I am from Senegal originally. I've been here in Minnesota for over 20 years now. Um, I am a Muslim. I am a black woman. I am an immigrant. I am a mom, a mom of a black boy. I am a mom of a black daughter and I am a mom of a black husband. And I am a healthcare provider. And as everybody has witnessed the last few weeks, uh, the trauma and the fear and the sadness and uh, 
uh, all those emotions that have been going on in our community. I say our community that involve everybody, not only here in Minnesota, but all around the world. Here in Minnesota, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, everybody has the same feeling of sadness of uh, what happened to uh, one of our members, uh, uh, George Floyd killing. And as a healthcare provider, I see this as, as a public health issue, a public health issue that needs to be uh, addressed. It needs to be addressed in every level, not only in the healthcare, but also in the foundation of this country. Um, just justice, leadership, healthcare, education, finance, uh, everywhere. But we can only do one step at a time of focusing on one thing at, uh, after the other. Right, I mean, today um, I have invited some wonderful ladies that I look up to, I respect and love. They are friends, they are support, and they are idols. They hear from one, a couple of the areas that are very crucial for these changes to happen. Those two areas are healthcare and education. So with me, I have uh, Dr. Meredith Bond, uh, who's a family, fa family medicine physician and who's a white woman who gets it and understand and pushing for in, uh, to fight for injustice and equality and who care while providing care in the healthcare, trying to give care for everyone. I'll let you guys hear more from herself in a minute. And also I have uh, Dr. Sally Perry Akobo, who's also a friend or sister uh, from Nigeria. Dr. Akobo has uh, several uh, degrees in the education. Not only as a medical doctor, she has a master's in public health, she has master's in business administration. Um, she's also uh, who, somebody who cares so much about uh, equality in healthcare, who cares about fighting injustice, and she'll also talk more about herself. And along with us, we have uh, another sister who is a nurse uh, like me and who works with me at Hennepin Healthcare, who's uh, Michelle Devonport. Uh, she's a great leader. She's a great mentor to all black uh, healthcare professionals who want to strive their way into the healthcare or who are struggling with personal emotions or whatnot. Um, she's, a, she's a great idol in a leadership and in a leader, she has been working uh, as a nurse for over 20 years and she also uh, strives for equality and fights for justice for everyone and she'll talk more about herself as well. And last but not least, we have um, my friend, uh, a friend of all Senegalese, all the Senegalese community knows know her. She, she's been in my life for over 20 years. This is Stephanie de France. She's a great human being. She's a great person. She's a white female who identify herself with all minorities, who takes minorities' issues as her own, and is always, always, unconditionally without any selfishness fighting for justice. She teaches uh, minority kids, second language kids, and um, she's always fighting for justice and trying to advocate for minorities. So um, I would like to welcome her and all of the ladies. And one after the other, we're gonna have them introduce themselves. 
We'll start with Dr. Bowen, Meredith. Well, hi there. Um, thank you, Bolo, for that wonderful introduction. Um, the feelings that you expressed are absolutely mutual, and I'm just honored to be part of this panel today with such wonderful, powerful women here. Um, I, as Bolo said, I'm a family medicine physician. I work in the Twin Cities um, in Minneapolis, and I provide care to people of all ages. So birth to the end of life, um, and one of the joys of my practice is also doing prenatal care and delivering babies. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. And uh, we will move on to Dr. Akobo Seliperi. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and good evening, any of you are actually tuned in from uh, the continent, because I know some people are actually watching. My name is Dr. Akobo, or Seliperi Akobo, like uh, Bolo said. Um, I am also family practice trained, or family medicine trained, but I currently actually um, do hospitalist medicine, which means I actually see patients in the hospital. Um, like Bolo said, I am passionate about God, I am passionate about people, I am passionate about culture, um, and I am passionate about justice. Um, I love learning, and uh, I consider um, that a lifelong thing, and I'm constantly open to figuring things out and learning more from people, and this is why I also love traveling. Um, because then I can actually get to learn from people's experiences, from their foods, from just... Um, thank you so much, Bolo, for having me here, and I really am looking forward to an amazing evening with these amazing women. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Akubo. And now we're going to move on to Michelle Davenport. Michelle? Um, while waiting for Michelle, um, let's, let's try Stephanie. Now I can hear you. I couldn't hear you before. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to those that are watching at different time zones. Um, my name is Michelle Davenport. I am a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for 29 years. Um, I have a lot of titles behind the name, so I just tried to condense it <laughs> and just say evangelist Michelle Davenport because I am an evangelist missionary as well. Um, I'm very passionate of helping those that are less fortunate and I'm um, passionate about education and making sure everyone knows what's available to them as resources as well. I'm a mom of four, grown children, grandma of 14, and I just became a great grandmother two weeks ago. So I'm excited about that journey. Um, I'm afraid for my grandson. Of, I have two sons, as I mentioned, um, four children, two boys, two girls, and I'm concerned. I'm concerned for their futures as well. And Bolo, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share with the nation. Thank you, Michelle. And congratulations to your granddaughter. Thank uh, you. Now we're gonna move on to Stephanie. I think she's on mute. I'm so sorry, thank you. My name is Stephanie DeFranz Schmidt, and I'm a public school teacher right here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I'm originally from North Central Iowa, and um, I grew up in a town of under 30,000 people, and it was about 92% white. Um, I've known since I was 10 years old that when I grew up, I wanted to move to St. Paul, Minnesota, and live in a diverse community where I could get to know people from all over the world, and I'm especially passionate about food which is one of the things I'm famous about in the Senegalese community is how passionate I am about, um, about soft and the onion sauce and the lamb and et cetera. 
Um, I teach at Phelan Lake Hmong Studies Magnet on the east side of St. Paul, and um, we have a Hmong Studies Ethnic Studies program, and I've also taught in Spanish version as well. So thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's great to have some things to do to, um, to fight for change in these times when we're still um, fighting for change. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you ladies, for the wonderful introduction. And um, without any further delay, we're going to move on to um, the topic, the other topics that uh, are the reason why we are here. And like I said, this is my first time doing this, um, you know, so just bear with me. We're going to try to do our best. Um, right now, what we're going to talk about is um, what is racism? Stephanie, since you're the last one to talk, so we're going to start with you. What do you think racism is? So when I think of racism, I think of two levels. I think of the ind individual and the systemic. So at the individual level, um, I think about having ideas that people's worth, um, that people's abilities, that people's personalities are linked to physical traits um, and I and then acting on that belief so that's how I identify the individual and I think that if you hold those beliefs even if you're not doing something it's breaking a little bit and that's and that's creating a society in which um, money, power, privilege are afforded to people based on those traits. Um, I'd like to also say that this idea, the idea of race was invented in the late 1600s. Um, there's more differences between us with, within our groups than there is between groups. And so, um, and it came up with colonization and a way for people who look like me my ancestors to hold on to power and to own other human beings. So um, it's really an open system that will survive today. We need to break it down. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, that's, uh, those are very important points. Nice explanation. Um, let's move on to Dr. Akubo. What do you think racism is? Is Dr. Octobo muted? No, I actually didn't hear the question, Bolo. OK, uh, please tell us what do you think racism is? What is racism to you? Um, so uh, in addition to uh, what uh, uh, Stephanie, I think, right? Yes. In addition to what Stephanie has said, um, racism um, technically um, means all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually go off of uh, what the uh, annual review of public health 2019 stated. They talked about three tracks of what racism can mean and signify. So there is the first part where you would talk about prejudice, which technically has to do with people going or making decisions based on um, on uh, limited information and on stereotypes. And then there is oppression which obviously is based on power, based on discrimination from being on a, a more powerful stance. And so technically when you put t those two things together, you have different paths of, uh, you have uh, racial prejudice, which could also have a social construct, and also it could also have an institutionalized part of it. Um, we take technically from that point of view, you have a system that is advantageous to a people based on what they look like. Um, and then there is also a system of oppression on a group of people based on what they look like. Um, but in general, the system as a whole is hinged on um, a white supremacy system. Um, and from what we know, racism affects everything. It affects education, it affects uh, healthcare, it affects people's access to, um, to opportunities, whether it is 
uh, where we work, whether it is how far we go along where we work, even when we're qualified. Um, so racism as a whole is just a system of oppression that tends to differentiate people based on what they look like, in this case, white and black, or white and minorities, which involves black, Hispanics, and all the other groups that come along that pathway. Very, very nice explanation. Um, a system that supports some and not others based on what they look alike. Thank you, Dr. Akabo. And now let's move on to Dr. Bourne. What do you think uh, racism is? I'm moving as well, thank you. I'd say I would agree absolutely with what Stephanie and Dr. Kobo already said, talking about racism um, as a system of power, oppression, privilege, and a very intentionally constructed system, um, as Stephanie mentioned. I think the danger of this system is that it is so insidious and it is so commonplace, it's been interwoven into the very fabric of our society, at least in the US at this point that I think many people, and I will specify, I think many white people and privileged people are so used to living in this reality that they don't even recognize that it's there. Um, so it's a dangerous system in that it provides power to some people, oppression to others, and it's a system that we have to actively acknowledge and work to unlearn because growing up in this country, it's automatically learned behavior. Thank you, Dr. Bourne. Um, that's very, uh, it's a very powerful statement. Racism is a system that benefits some without even knowing that it's there. And it's a learned behavior, that's right. Um, thank you for, um, thank you for your contribution on this. Now let's move on to Michelle uh, Devonport, who is an African-American woman. Uh, please let us, uh, tell us what you think racism is. It's a little bit challenging because we have more than one person in this call, so switching can be a little bit um, challenging, but uh, we'll get through it. Michelle. Okay. We got you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Michelle, and I am in agreement with everyone, what everyone has said. And I really didn't understand truly what racism, what racism was until I moved to Minnesota. <laughs> I, was born in, I was born and raised in New York um, by my great-grandmother, and she taught me to love everyone. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see color. I didn't see color at all. Um, she took care of the whole community, white, black, Hispanic. It didn't matter. And when I came to Minnesota, I, yep, I learned about it in school. Don't get me wrong. But because of what I all, like, um, I can't remember, Mer I think it's Dr. Meredith said, um, it's a learned behavior. And when I came here, I graduated as a nurse in high school. I just didn't take my boards. And I got hit in the front of racism, that power that we're speaking of. The person that had power over me was the guidance counselor. And she said, people like you would not be successful in the RN program. So I tried showing everything from, from high school, went to Clara Barton High School in Brooklyn, New York, and it didn't matter. She kept saying, people like you, and I, I wasn't getting it. Then finally, after she took my paperwork and put it in my hand and said, you're going to go and apply for the LPN program, that's when I realized what racism really was. And it didn't matter how much education I had. That's why I'm so passionate about making sure people know. My great-grandmother would say, people can take everything away from you. And that's anyone in position of power that continue to say they are over us. <laughs> they can't take away your education, and that's what I, to this day, still give back to all generations under me. That's why Bolo said I'm a mentor, I'm an idol. I don't see myself as an idol, I just see someone 
making sure you know race should not be part of this equation at all. It really shouldn't. So that lady's name was Julie, and God, I wish I could see her today because I'm finishing my doctorate right now. So I want to say it didn't affect me then. It still doesn't affect me now, but I know it's real, and we're facing it every single day. But we should love each and every one. The word of God says God is love, and we should love everyone. But racism is real, and we have to teach to that. We have to teach our children, our grandchildren. Now I have a great-grandchild that they're going to face it somewhere in their life. And I'll try not to cry because it, it really, it, it really it's effect, it affected me all these years, but I never gave up. And that was because of my belief in God and knowing what my great-grandmama way, way, way back said, love everyone. And that's what we need to teach. We need to teach to love everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that touching contribution. I'll start off where you ended it. Love everyone. Loving everyone is what I was taught growing up in Senegal. And like you, I never know what was race. I never knew what is racism. I was raised to see everybody as one and to love everybody. And like I said on one of my posts, uh, what I was taught is people are better than others based on their deeds and how they hold themselves, not based on what they look. And here, because that's what I was taught, that's what I was teaching my very young kids, that's why they never knew what is white or what is black. Like I said before, my daughter said, if she's telling me about a friend uh, in school, she'll say, oh, sh you don't know her, she's the peach one. <laughs> it's funny, I was like, what is peach? Oh, that's so cute, that's a, that's a cute description. And she calls herself brown, she calls them peach, her friends that are white. And it wasn't until yesterday that I that I try to explain to her what is race and what is racism because let's face it, it's reality. You have to call something what it is. In healthcare, if you don't call cancer cancer as a diagnosis, how are you going to cure it? How are you going to find the, medic the appropriate medication for it? So with my daughter and my son, I have to call it racism for the acts that we have been witnessing for them to understand in a child way and for them to be prepared because I don't want to shock them when they go out there and experience it for the first time and I won't be there to protect them. Also, I don't want them to learn it at school when I am not there to explain them in the best way they can understand. So that's why, that's why we are here. And that's why, as a community that's united, we need to call it what it is, and we need to find a solution for it. And after that, uh, our next question would be for you, the healthcare providers. You have seen so many, especially the ones that work with uh, the organization that we work with, we all have worked together, a great organization that is Hennepin Health that, was, that is catering to all walks of lives, all colors, all uh, social economical backgrounds where people are always welcomed and treated in there. But we have seen how much uh, this um, generational trauma, racism, have been affecting uh, some of the people that we see, specifically African Americans. So Dr. Bourne and Dr. Jack uh, Akobo, I would like for you, each one of you, one after the other, to tell us how do you think racism is affecting the health of African Americans? I would say uh, maybe Dr. Akabo, you can go first. Okay. I have to take a deep breath because this is uh, this is something that is very um, it resonates deeply with me. Um, 
First of all, I really want to appreciate the fact that the, uh, the AFP, which is the Association Academy of uh, the American Academy of Family Practice Physicians, uh, they actually on May 31st called racism a health, a public health issue. And I think this was long overdue. Um, and so it actually makes me happy that a lot more people um, are speaking from that point or from that precipice saying and calling this what it is. It is a public health issue. Um, a lot of data out there shows just how much racism affects um, minorities. And in this case, I will speak for African Americans. There's data there that show that when factored, even when you factor for socioeconomic status, which in this case, um, high education, amount of money made, we still are more likely than our white counterparts to end up having cardiovascular disease, we end up having um, or even dying from myocardial infection, um, infection, and a lot of other things. And one of the other ones, since we're all, a lot of us are women, let's talk about healthcare for women. Um, there's lots of studies that are showing now that black women are two to six times more likely to die um, peripatally, which is around um, giving birth, um, because of the issues um, related to uh, racism. Um, and this can range from access and then just the biases with getting the kind of care they need, um, with the way that our care and just literally um, how people perceive our health issues. And two big things that was in the news over the last couple of years was Serena Williams who had a baby and actually did say multiple times, I think I have a blood clot, I think I have a PE because she'd had it before, or pulmonary embolism for non-medical folks. And they didn't pay her any mind for a while. They said it was the pain medication she had taken that had made her confused. Um, so when you really look at it, um, I was looking at another data too from the Public Health Review that said that a lot of um, African Americans, technically by the time they're at, at age 25, are more likely to have, um, um, it says, a lower life expectancy. So technically because of the stressors, um, and some other studies have actually called it a dose dependent. So the more racism you're exposed to from time, um, you technically will be more likely to have a lower life expectancy. It is potent, it is scary, it is sad. Because I look at myself, I'm in my 30s, and the fact that I can say and I can actually infer that my life expectancy is cut short as is my siblings, my brothers, my friends, and everybody else just because of the effect of racism on our health. It doesn't matter whether you're eating right, it doesn't matter whether you're exercising, but the stresses, which are chronic, which also was uh, stated carefully by um, the Association of uh, Psychologists, they actually did say that too, that the chronic stressors from, from uh, racial disparities and, and discrimination actually affect uh, people of color um, African Americans and other minorities, and I think it's really sad. Um, it is. It is really sad. Thank you, Dr. Akabo. Um, that is so true. I I agree with you 100% on uh, the effect of all the conditions that uh, are thought to be secondary to racism that are affecting African Americans. Now, Dr. Bond, um, we want to hear from you what you think. How, how do you think racism is affecting African Americans' health? Thank you. Um, I think just to reiterate what Dr. Okobo said, um, she talked about sort of the chronic stress that specifically black and brown people in the US face and other indigenous folks and people of color here. And that's why we known as the weathering hypothesis, which has been around for a long time. Um, when we as medical professionals or scientists in the community do research on health disparities and health outcomes, we see across the board that people of color, um, specifically black and brown people, have worse health outcomes. And that's even when um, controlling for things like socioeconomic status, income, neighborhood that you live in, your family's background, we still see health disparities. The thought is that this toxic stress and this chronic 
daily trauma that people face leads to both hormonal and biochemical changes in the body. Um, and the very point to me, as a mother like many of these other people, is that this gets passed down generation to generation. Okay. Um, we know that black and brown people and indigenous people have higher rates of earlier and poorly treated heart disease, diabetes, cancers, high blood pressure. We know that these are found later than they are in white people, and we know that they're not treated to the same appropriate level that they are in white people. Um, Dr. Kibble mentioned uh, Serena Williams and the, and the blood clot, and we know that sadly black babies are twice as likely to die in the first year of life as white babies are. That's horrifying when you stop and think about it. Anyone who has children, has a family, I mean, that's, that's awful. I have a toddler. I mentioned I love delivering babies. I delivered a baby of a wonderful, beautiful black woman earlier this week, and I just thought, my goodness, this kid has half the chance of surviving that my daughter had and how I'm at. Um, and we also know that, that black and brown people in this country die at an earlier rate. Currently, the most recent statistics from the Center of Disease Control show that black men have a life expectancy that is 10 years less than white women in this country when they are born. I just let people think about that. Uh, like Dr. Provo said, it's, it's awful. It is dangerous. It is absolutely a public health crisis in this country. Thank you so much, Dr. Bond. And going to school for health care here, I always wonder, I mean, I always wonder when I hear every statistical analysis, all the worst conditions, the African Americans are the highest, whatever you name, cardiovascular, um, yesterdays, everything, and, 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 and I am always like, wait a minute, why is it called black? Black compared to whites? Because where I'm from, I did not see this. I don't have it. My ancestors did not have it. These people are black people. They look like me. And why is it that they are always the ones that have it? But guess what? The racism is why and it explains that. Michelle, we would like for you to tell us what you think of this racism on healthcare for black African-American people. So you hear what both of them said. It, it, it brings tears to my eyes, especially knowing that, sorry, it's okay. My my baby brother was 35 when he died of a massive heart attack. And most men will not go and get checked. Um, I used to always say, well, how will he get to Minnesota to bury me? But I had to go back to New York to bury him. And my younger, I have a younger brother he says he has no trust in health care. And it's because of that stigma. Because I think of sometimes when I used to go to the doctor before I was diagnosed myself with high blood pressure, but thank God it's under control. But when you give your family history, we're already labeled as African American. You're going to get diabetes, you're going to get high blood pressure. Oh God, you got high cholesterol. <laughs> so they're afraid. And it's because of that label, because you're black, it's your race. But it affects other cultures too. When I was finishing my bachelor's degree and I had to do a, I was doing a class on culture, I interviewed a, Af um, um, a sorry, a Latino young lady. And her grandfather, her grandmother, her father all died before 65 years old because of cardiovascular disease. And I had to be, I had to admit 
I only thought it was black people. <laughs> and I, I, it, it, because that's what I was taught. And that's what's always been said. African Americans will get this. African Americans, you never hear Latinos, white Caucasian, you don't hear that. So they, they really have a lack of trust in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And I know how much your brother means to you. And I'm sorry that he's not with you anymore. And um, you're right. Any ethnic group, any person, white or black, Latino, Asian, that went through what the African Americans went through, you're going to have um, all these kind of conditions, cardiovascular, anxiety disorder, depression. Um, during the border issues, like uh, deportations closing, I can't even tell you how many Latino patients that I had with anxiety. And anxiety can lead to high blood pressure, which le can lead to cardiovascular disease. So, you know, that's, we, we know the foundation of the problems. Also, um, um, I, I, just, I just have to agree with all of you of um, what, what, what the African Americans are going through and how it's affecting their health. Um, in compared to Africans, and you know, I, this is like a generational trauma. Like Dr. Bourne said, it's in, it, it gets, it becomes, it becomes inheritance. If you, if you have uh, anxiety, cardiovascular disease, um, and you live in the same condition, poverty, getting repressed, pushed down, and not access to healthcare, not access to uh, great neighborhoods where you can have all the support that you need. Those conditions are going to be passed down. And like Michelle said about the trust, there is a lack of trust that's preventing African Americans from seeking health care. And we all know that that trust comes also from racism. Why? And everybody knows there is an elephant in the room, which is the Tuskegee uh, experiments for syphilis in black men that went on for 40 years from, ni from uh, 1932 to 1942. That can break any trust that somebody can have. And I totally understand that. And that is part of the reason why a lot of older African-American men that I take care of that are over 65 or older will t tell me about that experiment and will tell me that that's why I don't trust healthcare people, that's why I don't go to the hospitals. So um, it, with that thought, before we go to uh, Stephanie about the education, um, I just want to ask anybody who's listening, if you would like to contribute, you can um, call the numbers that are on the screen, or you can comment if you have any question or any um, contribution to add. So from there, I think um, I would like to ask you, the healthcare uh, workers, providers, what do you think should we do to change that and to build the trust between providers and African American people? Dr. Bourne. Dr. Bourne is probably in mute. Oh, yeah. Can you hear? <laughs> we got her. People hear me now. Yes, yes we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Too quickly on the mute and unmute button. Um, thank you for that, for that question, Bola. Um, I think 
I mean, I think Michelle put it put it beautifully, saying, you know, people are targeted from the get go when they go into the the healthcare system, and they're facing stigma even before they walk in the door and as they walk in the door. Um, medical medicine as an institution has a really dark and disgusting history of institutionalized racism. Um, not just Tuskegee and the syphilis case, but the entire um, field of obstetrics. I mean, most of those studies were done on slave, black slave women in this country without anesthesia, and just horrific, horrific things that have been done to black and brown bodies um, through medicine. So I think, personally, as a white provider and also as a healthcare provider, one of the biggest things that I think I need to do and my colleagues do is to un is to learn about this history and then unlearn all those preconceived notions that we've been told about giving equal treatment to, to everybody um, and the fact that we like to pretend that we treat everybody the same because we don't even if we even if we're trying to um, that you're so interwoven into into medicine that it's important to acknowledge that and recognize it and at the same time it's really important to talk to patients about that I recognize as a white provider, when I have black and brown patients, we know that there's a huge lack of trust there. So I always think it's my role to acknowledge that and acknowledge there is a difference in our race. I recognize that. I will work to provide you the best care possible. And I will not be afraid to call that out um, and say what it is. I think the other big thing is just to listen to people and deeply listen to them and their stories and their realities um, and their truth and to honor their truth. My black and brown patients have a very different truth and a very different story than I have. They exist in the world in an extremely different way that is a lot more challenging than it is for me day to day. So honoring that experience that they have and deeply listening without having to give them my input um, and give them my recommendations is a really important first step. And then I think also um, helping out our systems and asking and demanding equality or at least movement towards more equity within the healthcare system is a big start. Making sure that we're hiring black and brown people, that we're supporting the pipeline to get healthcare workers of various backgrounds into the system to better reflect our patient population mentoring people of color um, and speaking positively and compassionately about them both to them and to other people are big steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowman. It's a heartwarming um, contribution and comments. And yes, um, Knowing the person's true story is the key. And I am so glad you're part of the healthcare, and I hope that we have more providers that think like you. Dr. Akobo, what do you think um, healthcare providers should be doing to help ease the racial disparity and build trust with African Americans or brown people or any minorities? Thank you, Bolo, um, and thank Dr. Bourne for putting that in such an amazing way. Um, I'm going to add, um, with representation, I'm going to give a story or actually share a story that means a lot. Um, I trained at uh, Hennepin Healthcare, um, and I remember my second year, my senior then was uh, another um, black lady, Chizoba. We had a black male patient. Um, we went in to see him together. And he literally stood out there and for five minutes was amazed that he was having two black female doctors. It was like we, we had to take, it, it took us a while to convince him that we were doctors, first of all, because he just had, it had never happened to him. He literally hadn't had a black doctor, according to what he told us. And now he had two female black doctors taking care of him. He was like, I'm going to call all my friends. He brought out his phone. He was so excited. Um, we got out of that place and we both debriefed. And it was, it was, it was poignant. It was, it felt warm that we could actually do that to a extent. 
him feel hopeful because he saw that. He, he literally told us how he felt like now he would take his health seriously because he felt represented. He saw someone that looked like him that was, that was trying to make him um, make better decisions. So representation is important. The other thing, obviously, beyond just having doctors, uh, black doctors or brown doctors, is also having um, brown, um, black African Americans and um, people um, at the table where decisions and policies are made. We all understand that with healthcare, whether it is the amount, the procedures that are done for people, the amount of days they stay, these are all policy dependent. Um, and a lot of times, people that look like us are not at the table. We don't have a lot of people that look like us right there in the boardrooms making these decisions. And until we actually have equal representation at that level, um, where people can actually fight for people who have um, issues that we feel personally because we are part of this and we see this, um, that would go along with in, in changing healthcare as a whole. The other thing that needs to happen is we need to deracialize medicine. Um, I think it was Michelle that had said that when she talked about the, the high blood pressure. The way she was trained, it was like only African Americans had high blood pressure. And that was how we were trained in medical school as well. It's like they tell you an African Amer a 60-year-old African American man presents with blood pressure of 180 over 110. You know, it's like a lot of times um, it actually adds to the implicit biases, right? And um, also with um, the crack epidemic and all these other things that people did in the past, whenever they put these vignettes, um, when we're learning medicine, they, they make it seem like these are the people, this is how they present. So a lot of times for a lot of people who practice medicine like us, um, that's what you're looking for. So you're looking for this druggies, you're looking for these people who break the law because that is exactly how medicine um, is thought. So we need to do racialize medicine. We need to see people, not necessarily African Americans, Hispanics, coming in with these things. And I think those things are important. Um, the other thing would be ensuring that we have more funds into healthcare facilities in poorer neighborhoods. Now, from what we know, a lot of times where you live, you know, what schools you go, you know, affects what schools you go to, and also the your access to medical care. And so we know that a lot of uh, um, healthcare centers in poorer neighborhoods tend to not be as equipped. So you have less specialists, you have less e equipment, which obviously also reduces the ability of these people to get the best care, the best trained people. Um, and so we need to do that. Um, there was also a postulation that says that if we increase community initiatives that help people, um, um, minorities, so technically, if we increase community initiatives in these poorer neighborhoods where, unfortunately, we tend to see African Americans, Hispanics, and minorities, that we can also build capacity. Now, if you build, if you build, build capacity, you build self-esteem. You build people's ability to take care of their health. Invariably, you have people who technically would work out more. You reduce obesity. If you reduce obesity, you maybe can reduce the incidences of diabetes. You maybe eventually can just literally reduce all the processes down the, the pathway that make sure or kind of make it um, make it more prevalent for people like us to be sick and end up dying and younger than other people. So these are some of the things that I think that we can do um, in healthcare. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the things that we can we can hopefully see soon enough to change the, uh, um, the spectrum or whatever it is we know healthcare to be right now. Thank you. That was wonderful, Dr. Akabo. Thank you so much. And um, yes, I heard representation. I heard uh, helping the communities. Uh, I heard uh, seeing the person. And um, yes, I, I completely agree. It's like a chicken and the egg. Like, if these people continue to live in these conditions that are always depriving them of every uh, resource that could have helped them have a better health, the cycle is going to keep repeating itself. And the label is going to stay there. And like Dr. Bond said, um, see the person as a whole. Don't just see the label. 
And I'm going to let Michelle uh, add something as another healthcare uh, provider. Hello, everyone. So to piggyback. Hold on, Michelle, I'm sorry. We, we have a caller. Um, let's get that okay. call and then we'll get back to you. Okay. All right. We have a caller. Hello? Yeah, hello? Yes. Who's, who's speaking? Yeah, this is Musa. This is the host of Chronic Villa Children on Tempo Africa TV. I'm calling to us. Thank you, and um, yes, we are listening. Overdue, because we are learning a lot from what uh, the guests are uh, uh, teaching us today. I think uh, I would like to commend you just, you know, just to congratulate you for this uh, very wonderful show. And then I would like to also extend my greetings to your guests who are doing uh, a wonderful job in forming us this discussion, as I said, has been long overdue, and we are very thankful that we are having it today. Thank you so much, and I hope you will come back again and again to keep informing uh, us about health issues, you know, or risk-related you know, issues that are affecting health and health, etc. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and you're welcome. Um, thank you so much. And uh, yes, we welcome callers and questions and comments. And ladies, I'm going to get back to you. Um, we have callers that are appreciating uh, that you're here helping. We were going to ask Michelle to tell us what she thinks um, should we do as healthcare workers, providers. Uh, to help ease the racism in healthcare and how to build trust with African Americans or brown or minorities. I would like to talk, um, you know, as we, when I used to be a staff nurse, um, I love telling stories too. <laughs> um, as a staff nurse um, working at Hennepin County, um, back then we were Hennepin County Medical Center before we went on Hennepin Healthcare, um, I had a patient. Um, he was struggling with alcoholism um, and he definitely, we had the protocol in place for him to get the medication to help with his withdrawals. But the provider um, said, um, he's a frequent flyer, that's the term you'll hear. He's a frequent flyer, he comes here all the time. Yeah, he does, I know, I work that floor. He came all the time, but he was sick. He was very, very sick. And I had five patients that day, four down one hallway, he was down the other hallway. And he was throwing up, he was in withdrawal, and he had diarrhea. So I'm trying so hard to kick, keep his, manage his care at the time. And I asked the provider if we could escalate him to an intermediate care unit where he could get the Valium that he needed IV. That resident said to me, I'm not going to change that order. Keep giving him the oral pill. Fine. Okay. So I went up to the attending, which we really don't escalate. We'll stay at the residence, but nope, I need help. So the attending said to me, I'm going to go by my residence assessment and we're not moving him. So I'm trying to manage this patient plus four other patients. And this, I went into the room and he says, I, he started crying. He said, I know you're judging me. No, no, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to provide the best care I can. But it hurt my heart that I'm on the front line with this patient, seeing how sick he was. And the provider over, I mean, yep, there's a power, that word we used earlier. He has more power than me, much more education than me. But I was seeing what was going on, and I did not get that support. We have to step back and listen to the patients as what has been said today. They know themselves. We're not there to judge. And that's another reason why so many won't seek the care, because they're going to be judged. Um, I think about me. Nope, I'm not skinny like I used to be growing up. I've gained a lot of weight in the years. <laughs> and when I walk into a uh, into the clinic setting and um, the providers, I mean, 
we have this program uh, called, I think it's called Slim Down or whatever it is. And I was so excited because I've been losing weight. My blood pressure, as I sh shared with you all, has been, my God, I ain't never had these good numbers in many years. And I was so excited about that program. And I had my list of what I've been doing. I mean, I'm drinking water. <laughs> and I'm not one for water. And that nurse practitioner said to me, when she just walked in, and what was crazy is I used to work with her on the floor. And she said, well, your BMI is this. Would you like to, you're a candidate for a bariatric surgery. Would you like the surgery? Well, um, that's not what I had. I mean, she said, oh, and you already had your labs done, so you don't need your labs. I said, oh, well, okay, well, I got this list. I'm trying to show her this list. I'm doing so well. And I never got to share that because she wasn't listening to me. She just came in there seeing, okay, this obese lady, her BMI is this, and she needs bariatric surgery. No, I didn't want the surgery. I wanted someone to guide me. I wanted someone to hear me, honestly, and help me. I want to control my blood pressure. I think I'm doing really good. I never got that. And then she said, well, I'll see you in two weeks. So I said, well, I'll be on a cruise. She said, oh, well, you sure won't pay attention and do the full out that plan. So don't worry about it because you're going to eat everything you want on the boat. So when you get back to America, oh, I'm, I'm about to die in this room at the moment. I'm like, oh, my God, I, I, I'm going to try to eat better on the boat. Yeah, I know I'm going to be on the boat for two weeks. <laughs> but she wasn't hearing me at all. And I walked out of that room. And I went out into the lobby and I sat in the chair and I just started bawling. And this lady was sitting there and she looked at me like, well, I don't want to go in there. Whatever they told her, I sure don't want to hear. <laughs> but it was so sad that, that this is somebody that I trusted, thought they were going to be there for me and help me on my journey. And, and I'm, I'm a nurse too, you know, but I didn't get that. So when that happens to me, I think of what happens to the patients that go into settings or are admitted into the hospital and they're not heard. Thank you. And um, I am sorry you went through that. Like every one of you has said, uh, not judging and connecting, building trust is a key. As I went through my journey into nursing schools, I fell in love with the teaching of holistic care. That's why I don't look at the patient just seeing what I see in front of me. I try to look at where this patient is from. I try to look at what is the past of this patient, what's going on around their life, and that's where I base my decision off. That and being a case manager as a background that helps me see the patient as a whole, but not just as a patient that is keep coming back or somebody who's a drug or alcohol addict. And also having sympathy in our hearts going to see that patient is very helpful into not judging. Also, working with teams, um, we have to work as teams. We have to listen to nurses. Nurses are the patient's representatives. They are the patient's um, advocates. They see them more than any provider can. They know them more than any provider. That's why when a nurse tells you something as a provider, you should listen. Also, we should not pass judgments on patients from a provider to a provider or from nurse to nurse. I always refuse to hear people tell me, oh, get ready, this patient is very hard. They are very tough and stuff. I, I always say, I don't want to hear it. I want to see it for myself. Maybe my experience is, will be different than yours. Maybe we have two different approaches. And uh, most of the time, I use my approach that works for me, and it just end up being fine. Mm -hmm. So we all t you all talked about representation in the healthcare of black and brown. We cannot have representation without education. And on that note, we're going to go to uh, Stephanie de France, who is a wonderful teacher who cares about including everybody, wherever they are from, immigrants, minorities, poor, everybody, um, she's there for them. 
Stephanie, my question for you as a white female teacher is that, tell me how do you think uh, racism is affecting education? I would like to make it clear that I'm not an expert at educating um, black and brown children. Um, I'm here because I'm a white woman who, fight, who it, it gets at my core because I want to do the best that I can for my kids and I've grown a lot and I've worked really hard and I'm also fighting for change. But I just want to place into the space that um, the real experts at ed educating black children are their aunties, their moms, their grandmas. Um, my black colleagues and black friends have taught me so much and I just want to honor nothing that I say today is something that is like an expert thing. It's things that I've learned from, um, from people who I am very humbled and very honored to have been able to learn from. So I just wanted to say that before I begin. So um, one thing that is affecting our black children is, um, is that most of their teachers look like me. Um, most of their teachers are from similar backgrounds of me. And, um, and so I think a lot of times, um, especially when I began, I, I was raised with like TV, media. Um, I didn't have a ton of black friends growing up. There were only a few in our town. And so, um, but it was the 90s and we saw the news and we saw like they always were showing like the scary inner city. And um, that was what we saw on cop shows and on TV shows back then. And so it was my dream to move to the city and I knew I had some unlearning to do, but it took me a long time to really to really do that. So I think that what happens is um, white educators like me, if, if you're not aware that that's the framework you're coming from and that's your mindset, um, you can, your black children in your classroom are, you're going to either approach them as sort of hyper, they're going to feel hyper visible or invisible. And it took me a while, and this is something I learned from, um, from black educators who talked about their own experiences both in real life and on Twitter. Um, it's weird because white educators, we will tend to kind of vacillate between those two things. And so a student will be both hyper visible in terms of white teachers are noticing when they whisper to a friend or noticing when they, I don't know, just the smallest, the smallest things that the white teacher views as misbehavior. Um, we white educators often will notice it right away and like kick on it, you know, like shut it down, whereas other white children in our classroom and sometimes Asian children getting at the model minority myth, we might not notice it at all. And so, um, and so this, the child then feels like picked on and very frustrated and then often their behaviors might get more frustrated and they, like, I don't know, I don't know about your child, but my child, when she's frustrated, her, she's the type that will get louder and um, sh share her feelings more loudly. And so that's no way to learn. You can't learn if someone's picking on you. But the other piece is that um, often we, our black students are invisible as well. We don't see them. We don't see them for who they truly are inside. Um, we don't see we don't see their true gifts. And even when we see them, we take the negative side to them. So we might call a, a black young woman bossy, for example, and not see that she's a leader. She's a leader and she's outspoken and she has, she has strength to share with all of us and we should listen to that. Even if sometimes that wasn't the exact, maybe like the time that you were hoping for her to share that with you, you can talk to her about like, thank you so much for sharing, sharing those perspectives with me about my teaching in the middle of class. Can we have a time to talk about this more later? Because I, I actually want to listen to you and I'm really sorry that, that this, you know, like you can really like help, help guide students to find out how to interact. Like sometimes it's even, sometimes it's even like, like help, I have to help them understand like, like how, I don't know, just how those gifts are gifts. Like they don't always see them as gifts in themselves either. And so that's really huge. But it took me a lot of unlearning of the media I had. I had to change entirely the media I was getting and really dig deep and think about me as a white liberal. I'm not a savior. I'm not an expert. I'm here as a guest in this community. 
my family's, my school has, um, it's mostly Asian American, and we have fewer, um, fewer black and African American children. And so the fact that my families are willing to send them to me in my school is like a gift. And I really try to take that seriously. So I try to see them the way that their favorite auntie sees them or their grandma sees them or their mom or their dad, and just really see them with that love. And that's something that any white educator, any educator at all can do. We can all do that. So, but I, I think that if we don't first see how we're seeing, like if we have glasses that like have stuff on them, if we don't like take those off and clean them off, we can't truly see. So I feel like, I feel like that's what, I, I feel like our, how we act comes out of our, how we're seeing and we have to change that. And it just gets really deep because the small, the small picking, you know, like the small behavioral, like, you know, stop that clip down or whatever your behavioral system is that start in, when, when they start in kindergarten, they love school. And often by the time they're in older elementary, they don't. And then by the time they're in middle and high school, as they become stronger and speaking out and teachers come down, that's when you start having school resource officers sometimes or other police. They, they, it goes from small misdeeds to suspensions to police involvement, and that's where the school to prison pipeline comes at. So I think that it, it starts small and it starts on the individual, but there's also systemic pieces that we have to change. and. Um, we have to show up for our kids, we have to see them, and then we have to hold it serious to educate them and make sure that they are learning, they are growing. Um, gotta love them. Funny. Um, what a great insight, uh, full contribution. And um, you are not an expert, but you are doing a very good job. and. Working with uh, Asian American and few blacks is all uh, minority, and I think most of them have the same uh, experience or uh, needs. And um, yes, the, the, the other question that I know a lot of people have or would have is uh, for you, I know you're not an expert and you probably don't have the experience, but what do you think that is? that um, it's always reported that white uh, female teachers tend to be intimidated by uh, school-aged boys or even sometimes girl, girls. Why, why do you think that is? Stephanie. Hi, sorry. Again, I, I think it really gets at how we how we see our students and if we're seeing through the lens of what what we saw in the media and what we thought was true based on um, the culture at large, what we heard people say. Um, I think that we're, we're seeing them, but we're seeing them through a lens of the media and how the media portrays. And that's when you get people thinking children are older than they're older. That's where you get Trayvon Martin in what the police did to Trayvon. That's, so I think that, um, I think that white female teachers often are not seeing the child, but they're seeing the child and what they think they're going to become, which is a lie. It's a lie that that's, it's a lie that the media is telling us, it's a lie that the news and the, the TV is telling us. And the way to not, the way to stop seeing people that way is to, is to really get in relationship. Well, first, you have to unlearn some stuff, right? Like, you're not going to be able to get in relationship with black and African American people if, if, until you clean those glasses off, right? Like, you're just going to be harmful to African American and black um, people of color, colleagues, and friends, and don't do that. So, clean off your glasses, change your media diet, start reading books by, by African and African American authors. Um, you need to start going on Twitter, like, especially if you're in a small town like I was. I did my best at teaching myself from the public library, but we had, we didn't have that many choices there back then. Now we have the internet, so you can follow. There are people who on Twitter will tell you what they actually think about the world, what their actual experiences are, and it's a gift. It's a gift that we 
can just listen. So I think first, really clean your glasses and really examine your own prejudices, your own viewpoints. And then after that, as you do, as you are more able to listen and be vulnerable, you can really change and listen, but you also have to really work on your own white fragility because um, as a white person, especially when, when we're just starting out, it's gonna happen more often. Um, it's happened to me many times. You're gonna say something and it's gonna be super racist and you didn't mean it, that wasn't your intention, but it was. And if someone calls you out on that, you have to thank them and you can cry later, don't cry in the moment and don't go, oh my God, oh my God, I didn't mean that. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then start crying because then you took all the attention back on yourself. And that's hard. Like that wasn't something that, that was hard for me at first. I am I mean, I'm just, it's true. It's hard for me at first. So read Robin DeAngelo's work on white fragility. Take it to heart and really practice. Like practice even in the mirror if you have to. Like, like think of something accidentally racist you could say, say it. Pretend someone called you out on it and then practice just saying, I'm so sorry, I'm going to think about that. Thank you for sharing. And then, like, like because that's a gift, if someone's willing to call you out because there's a lot of racist stuff that people say that, that your uh, friends and colleagues of color are just ignoring because it's not even worth it. So if they think it's worth it, that means that that means something and it's a gift. But don't... Tr- don't try to just be like, I'm going to come up with a black friend. I'm going to go find one. Just come after them. Like, that's not going to work either. It has to be a slow process. You have to start by cleaning off your own glasses and changing how you see the world first. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I love what you just said, everything that you have said. Um, before I comment on it, we have a caller that's coming. Uh, let's take the caller. Hello. Hello. Hi, Bolo. Hi. Salome, I have a question. Who is this, please? Salome. Okay, my name is Salome. Salome, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Sai, thank you for calling. No problem. I really, I think this is a great conversation and I'm enjoying it. I have a question for Stephanie. Um, so, my question is. Well, so and I apologize for my kids there in the background. It's okay. Um, so she really brings up very important uh, point, and I commend her for that. My question is: be as parents, what can we do when we see that the teacher is doing what she just expressed is a picking on our children or kind of ignoring them? So how should we address that? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salome. Did you hear what she said, Stephanie? I, yes, I did, and I'll, I'll do my best, but I also will put it out to, um, to the other guests, too, because they've been in that parent role. I, I'm a white mom of a white child, and so, um, and so I can think, um, I think from my perspective, um, you know, trying to reach out to the teacher, trying to create a connection with a teacher and um, you know I think if you're able to if you're able to to maybe bring up the issue um, I bring up the issue from your from your own personal perspective and what you saw what you heard what you felt um, I think that can I think that can sometimes work but I definitely I definitely know that um, I've seen some teachers really react poorly to to being called out, and so um, what I what I do know is if one thing I would say is if there are if there's a principal or, or someone else at that building who um, does understand, sometimes they can help intervene. But if you can talk to the teacher first, it's great. But I'm gonna stop right there because this is something that. Um, that I suspect that, for example, Michelle, if she's willing, I'd put her on spot, but one of the other guests might have a better a better idea since I've only been on the other side of the table. Like the conference, parent-teacher conference table, I was on the teacher side for this issue. Yes, I'm willing to talk about it because I'm dealing with it right now. I'm raising four of my grandchildren. 
So I'm living this new life all over again. It's not, you know, when I raise my own children, I'm literally back. I mean, they're all young, too. So the youngest is seven. The oldest is 13. Um, so right now, my um, nine-year-old grandson, I saw, well, he's on meds. He's got ADHD, so attention def attention attention deficit hyper <laughs> hyperactivity disorder. So there's been challenges and he was being called out and he was being told that well, did you take your meds today and this is the teacher saying that to him so then he was starting to act out even more so i just started going up the chain as you said stephanie there's a principal there's some there like at their school they have a, um, a dean of student i pulled a conference together i yes i have to be at the hospital all the time but i sure can be on the telephone you all come to the table. We're going we gonna to figure this out. Because that label, <laughs> you got ADHD. Yeah, we know what he has. But it wasn't fair that the whole school was starting to ask him, did you take your meds today? Did you take your... No, you must have not taken your meds today. That's not okay for him. It, it really is not. So you got to be involved. I'm his advocate. Since he can't be his advocate, I'm going to be his advocate. My world is HIPAA. I know there's some kind of policy for something in education. I didn't know what it was, but I'm going to try to, try to figure it out. Because we can't talk about our patients, so how could his business be out there in the school? So I just kept, I went to Pacer Center. I started research. We got the internet. <laughs> so I'm going to find out what resources there for my grandson, because it's not fair what he was facing. So it did get turned around, but it took me to be that bigger person. No, I, I don't swear. I, I'm just real. I'm going to tell you how I feel in a nice way, and you're not going to get a swear word out of me, but I got to protect him. He's a woman, number one. He's an African-American male. What, I don't want him to just all his whole educational journey be to, uh, I got ADHD. I ain't going to do this. I ain't going to. No, we got to try to stop it now. So thanks for allowing me to speak stuff because I am living, truly living it right now. And you have to be involved. Be at those conferences. Look at the report card. Go through that report card with them because last year before we went to distant learning and stuff, I wasn't feeling that he can go to fifth grade yet. And then we went to distant learning, and now I'm sitting right next to him one-to-one, -one, and he's trying to play a computer game. I'm like, what the world? Is that what they told you to do? <laughs> you got to be involved. You got to be involved. I made a very hard decision. I've held him back this year. I did. I wasn't seeing the progress I wanted to see for him to move to fifth grade, and I got a lot of pushback from a lot of folks. They were like, how are you going to do that to him? Well, if I don't do it now, somebody's going to do it to him later. So I've made that decision now, and that was because I've been so involved with his whole educational journey. I hope that helped the caller. I agree with you, uh, Dr. Salemi. I mean, I, I'm not the teacher, but as a parent, I think it's very important to advocate for our kids. We know our kids better than anybody because we are at home with them and we know what we are teaching them at home and what we are sending at school. Therefore, uh, we have to be involved in our kids' schooling. We have to be knowing who their teachers are and we have to be uh, showing the teachers that we know our kids and we know what's going on. Uh, as a mom of a special need child, um, I had a lot of encounters with uh, the teachers and the school system, I just have to be there and advocate and sit down around the table with everybody that's involved and show them that I know my staff, I know what's going on with my kid's life, I know um, how it should be for his school. Just like the chance that I give to my patients and their family, I apply that to school. I'll give them an example. If this was my patient, I'm going to have the family involved. We're going to work together to find a solution, and this is what's we're going to, what, what we're going to do here. And most of the time, it was very successful, and we ended up being a team and working together in helping my child. And 
I think every parent should be involved, should know their kids. Don't just let school be uh, t making decisions for your child without your input. That's how I feel as a parent. Um, I hope that helps you, uh, Dr. Salem, Salome, and thank you for uh, joining us today. And ladies, you can share this live on your pages, um, you who are here or whoever is watching, because it's very interesting conversation that anybody can benefit from or can join. Um, so here, after talking, after very nice input uh, from Stephanie de France, the teacher. Um, I took few things from what you have said. Clean up your lenses so you don't see from the same lenses that you have been seeing. And have a media diet, I love that. And trust me, I have a lot of friends who are uh, white and that are very, very nice. I know their hearts. There is nothing racist or bad in it. But because of bad media, you see something in the media and you share it on your page without digging it out and then it makes you look bad. It makes you look like you're racist or you're biased. So before you share anything on your um, timeline, me most of the time anything that I share on my timeline is something that I research and believe and I meant. Just don't share anything that you see because you never know um, without knowing what you're sharing. Therefore, having a media diet to educate yourself. If you're not a racist, uh, don't just get a black friend to just cover up that, oh, I have a black friend, I don't, I'm not a racist. Being racist or not being racist, it's not who you are with or who you're hanging out with, it's what you're doing and what you're saying and your actions. And from here, um, we are at our last questions, uh, last topic of the, of the day. Um, what I want, we are all from different backgrounds, all of us five sitting, uh, five sitting here. Based on your personal experience and your background, your ethnicity, tell me what you would say to the community members, whether it's the white people or black people, or brown people or Asian, what, are you, what, what advice are you telling them to help make us, to put us together and fight racism and disparities and injustice? Dr. Bourne, please, uh, can you go first? That's a big question, and I thank you for it. Well, <laughs> um, I, I think, the biggest thing is working on unlearning what you've learned, right? Dis dismantling racism is not going to happen overnight. It's an iterative process. It's a continuous process that you have to keep working at. Um, so really unlearning that. And then holding other people accountable. So holding ourselves accountable and holding our colleagues, our friends, our family members, even though it's uncomfortable, holding them accountable for the you know, non-racist thing that they didn't mean to say that just came out the wrong way. Um, calling people out on it with love and with compassion, right? But saying, hey, this is, this made me feel uncomfortable. This is not who we are as a people. I think that's the biggest thing moving forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Bourne. Dr. Akubo, what do you think, uh, our com as, com as a community, what do you tell to the community members? What advice do you have um, to help ease racial disparities and injustice and everything that's going on? Hold on, we are not hearing you yet. It's kind of like muted, are you muted? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I said I agree with Dr. Bourne, um, but I think I would also come from a uh, two-pronged uh, phase. First of all, I would talk to Cole or um, 
African Americans and black people and minorities. Um, and from that point of view, first thing, we need to unify. Um, there's so much division amongst African Americans and black people. Um, and until we come together, until we develop our strengths, until we actually educate ourselves as well, um, grow um, personally as a collective, fit, focus on wealth building, which is very important because a lot of um, what we're going through is also because um, we're very much uh, deprived when it comes to wealth. Um, a lot of the data out there shows or states that for every one dollar that, for every one dollar of wealth in white families, we have six cents in black families. That is profound. So black people need to figure out how to build wealth, how to get themselves to the point where they are unified, um, and be very vocal and have one voice about what they're looking for justice-wise and reforms. So that is one. Now, to our white counterparts and our allies, um, like Dr. Bourne, you know, I love you. Um, the Stephanie's and all the other white friends that I have were amazing. Um, there are a couple of things, especially with what's going on right now. On all the grief and um, the anger that black people are going through or feeling. Um, it's real. For a lot of us, we're triggered by everything happening. Um, and in that place, um, listen, be open to just hear us. Um, a lot of times we don't feel seen, we don't feel heard, um, we want to feel like you hear us, we want to feel like, you know, what we're saying makes sense. Don't just want to respond, don't feel like you have to respond, just hear us. Um, and when we talk about anti-racism, it's not anti-white. <laughs> when you're a part of us and you feel like you want to be an ally, you want to join us, don't just say I'm not racist, be anti-racist. Be intentional about speaking up against what is happening, the institutionalized and socially constructed um, parts of, of discrimination and just oppression that we go through. Um, and then, in general, I think there needs to be, you know, an avenue of communication, you know, a platform where people can actually be themselves without judgment and air their views from both parties, because we want to hear what you guys think as well. Um, I think that's important. And from um, from a political point of view, I know that this wasn't probably supposed to be political, but as a people, we need to understand the culpability of uh, of uh, elected for officials and also law enforcement agents. Um, and so, from that point of view, we need to know their names. We need to know exactly what their policies are. We need to know what where they stand. We need to know where they voted, for, and we need to go out and vote. Your voices are important. You can't change things if you don't get out there and hold people accountable. So when you put people in office, you want to hold them accountable. They made promises, you want to look back and say you made these promises and you didn't keep them. So it's important. And this we can't do alone. And this is part of why our allies and people, uh, other white people need to join us. So uh, these are a few things that I, I need to say. And we need to lobby. We need to be a part of it. We need to get out there and lobby. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Akabo. And this is very pertinent. And I know we have a long way to go, but we'll get there someday. We have a caller that's coming, and let's get that before we move on. Hello? Yes, hello? Yes. Thank you for calling. Who's this? Yeah, this is uh, Mr. Serge uh, Nawa from Temple of Faith TV. Mm -hmm. uh, the host of the grand debate. First of all, I uh, would like to say thank you and uh, welcome to Temple Afri TV. And uh, what you are doing is really, really, really good. Thank you. Yes. Um, you were talking about, uh, you know, the people. Whatever you are black, green, uh, yellow, red, we are the same people. The domain of definition of this is the human right, right. the human being. And we need to respect each other. We need to be treated as the same. And today, what is wrong is uh, the politics. They are the one who can give us all of us. Talking about the media, 
you need to make sure that sometimes you cannot count on media to find yourself. The media are called by a uh, limit who told you, who, who, who can tell you to do whatever they want you to do. And uh, instead of the media inform you, this is the government who can inform you, who can inform the media, and media can inform you. And now what we need is, is the freedom of the media. We have more orientation of all this media, but you have to make sure that if you get some information on the internet, make your research, and uh, make sure that you know what you are looking for is that. Uh, don't uh, don't uh, you know on on uh, common media straight you know to just uh, send the information. We got started, and uh, I can say again, welcome, and uh, everybody are welcome on Two Perfect TV. This is what I can say for now. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful contribution, and um, you're absolutely right. We cannot just rely on the media. We have to do our research and not let the media educate us, because most of the time uh, there is a hidden agenda behind what they feed us with. Um, so we're going to continue to our rounds. Uh, Dr. Akabo, thank you so much for your wonderful contribution. Um, moving along to maybe Stephanie. I know you, you, you gave a wonderful advice to clean lenses and to do media diet. Anything you can add on to addressing the community um, as to how can we ease racism and how can we uh, make changes? Yeah, yes. So um, the cleaning the lenses is part of the internal work. And so starting from there, um, some more things you can do besides changing your media and try, trying to change your lens. Um, as a white woman speaking to other white, white people, um, another thing you should really do is try to build yourself um, white white uh, ally friends that um, are anti-racist and who are farther along than you are and try to see if you can um, establish a friendship and a mutual accountability with them and learn from them and I think this is super important because um, years ago when I was just starting out I didn't realize how much processing my own racial shame and my own racial grief how damaging that was to my friends of color and um, it was another it was never something that, that they like the fact that no one ever complained and that people still loved me and accepted me um, is beautiful, but I, I realize now how um, that's not fair and that some of the work that I have to do really should be work that I do with other white folks. So I really recommend so that you can be a supportive person and not um, adding not adding oppression up onto, your, onto friendships with people of color so really get yourself another white person to process this through and call your call each other out and really build on that um, going more to the systemic think about the institutions that you're a part of and how you can um, work with others in those institutions to change so um, I'm part of I'm, a, I'm part of a church that's um, a predominantly white church in St. Paul and um, I've been part of some efforts and then they kind of luckily just kind of grew from there but I started like I was like I like to be the ideas person and then if it can grow out without always being me that's awesome but um try to work get other people to work on how do we fight racism within ourselves and within our communities how do we how do we partner with communities and not come in as white saviors so um so with that also within my school and in my school district and in my union. Um, I also it's cutting off a little. Communities of color need white people to stand up with them, stand up with them. If put your privilege on the line, sometimes you're gonna put your body on the line. Um, you have, have to, but this is a long haul. Once you commit, you're committed for life and it's a mirror. Earth. 
it's, there's an internal work and then there's a personal like relational piece and then there's a systemic work and um, as a white person your lane is working with other white people honestly so um, that's where you need to really focus thank you so much um, what a pertinent contribution working on yourself and then working on uh, your relations within the system and aligning yourself with people who are like you and who think like you. That's a great idea, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Uh, Michelle, what do you think uh, the community members uh, should be doing to fight racism and racial disparities? Well, I'm blessed to be I thank God for the position that I've been placed in all my life, honestly, because I started back with my great grandmother, Flossie Washington, where she took care of the whole community. And that's all I've seen my entire life. So the homeless, I mean, I'm out there in the community talking to everyone. I'm a faith community nurse. So I'm part of the Church of God in Christ organization. And I'm also a faith community nurse. So I'm out there teaching patients and why I call everybody's going to be a patient <laughs> teaching the parishioners about their health um, but it starts with everything every avenue so I'll say the church my work my home <laughs> the community I'm teaching somebody so I start with my own culture and I take somebody under my wing I am that mentor I am trying to show them what's going on in the world right now I'm out there yep this is not good it's not good what happened but how can we change this so as it's already been said being able to vote lots of us won't vote i think this year you better go vote if you want to really truly see that change not to get onto politics but if you want to see that change we got to be the voice we got to be the voice then i heard we need to listen we do have to listen as i said about listening to the patients if we want to know someone, we got to get to, we got to just take that extra minute to listen to them. Nobody would ever know I was raped, I was abused, all of these things that have happened to me in my life, but you see me as this black, well, she's just a black woman. No, but you don't know what I went through. So take that time to just, what happened to them? So many of us, and it's not just African Americans, it's other cultures too they don't feel you're going to be heard so why do i speak up why do i even share who i am i'm going to be judged so if i told somebody i was on drugs if i was an alcoholic i mean my dad was a heroin addict nope yep did i deny it i sure did but now i tell people my dad was a heroin addict and i how can i help you with your addiction how i'm going to listen to you because I know I went through it myself, watching my dad. And my dad died at 49 of a heart attack. Then I told you my brother was 35 at a heart attack. So now I'm going to be a voice until I, until God takes me off this earth. I'm going to educate. I'm going to listen to people. I'm going to take somebody under my wing. As we talked about, my granddaddy used to always say, prepare for the what if day. I never knew what that what if day was until I was about 30 <laughs> when I started realizing I need to build that wealth, as what's been said on our discussion today, too. We got to have something for that what if day. We're living in that what if day right now. People out of work. People can't go to church. People are on furlough. I mean, I, who? I've been a nurse 29 years. I never been told I'm going on a furlough. What's a furlough? I even had to look it up on the internet. What, is, what, what does that word mean? We're living in that what if day. So we need to take those people under our wing. If it's somebody that's struggling, that pregnant mother that's being abused, I take her under my wing. That homeless person, I make homeless bags for the community. Now, what? last summer, I saw more families out there on the side of the road homeless. So now my mind is like, okay, now I gotta prepare my bags for men and women, but I gotta add some stuff for kids. So, and it's all colors. God is love. My daddy says it all the time, but when he ends our prayer, God is love. We have to show this love. Every race that needs us, we need to be out there for them, from the youngest to the oldest, because the young, that younger generation, they really need us. They really need us.
because all they are that media is showing them that you're gonna get you're gonna get abused, you're gonna get beat up by the cops, you're gonna be there. Not everybody's bad, but that's all they're seeing, and they're not taking that time to research the story. They're just going by what they see. I won't post nothing either until I really I'll go try to find the story and what's the real truth there. So each and every one of us and everybody that's listening and everybody that's going to listen, we need to just take that extra step to listen to someone and give them the tools to be successful. Race ain't going away. We're going to have to keep on working on this. But we have to teach them, yep, you might face this, but you can overcome this. And as you all know, I love education. They can't ever, ever take away our education, but we have to educate ourselves. We have to educate ourselves and then share that knowledge with those that don't know and don't know that they can get this, they can have this, you can be anything you want to be. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't because you surely can. But it takes all of us to help build the future generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That's wonderful. And I hope that the young uh, people are listening to you and they'll take that advice to educate themselves. Education is a weapon that nobody can take away from you. We have a call coming. Hello? Did we have a call? Okay, the call is disconnected and um, hopefully they'll come back. We would like to hear from callers or uh, people who are commenting. Uh, Malik, you can look at the comments. If there is any questions, please let us know. Thank you so much, all of you ladies. It's so wonderful and I hope that people are listening, are learning something from what you guys are uh, have been saying. I know I have. Um, what I would add to what you all have said is that um, I, first of all, agree with everything. And um, what I would add is addressing, as, as a black person but who's not African-American, I am from Africa, I'm from Senegal, and sometimes I feel like I'm a witness. I, I am here to witness what's going on between black and white people because I wasn't here when all of this was starting and I don't know what is the beef between them. When I came in here the first time uh, 20 years ago, I have so many great white friends that I call family up until today, we are family. Uh, they're closer to me than my family back home. We share everything, and birthdays, uh, celebrations, and visits, and cooking, and everything. And also, I have uh, family members who are African Americans. Um, my immediate family, which is my husband's family, I haven't heard anything uh, towards like uh, white uh, and black. I, they are very unique, different family. But I have heard, uh, I went to, first time I came to the US, that the first year I left my host family, which is in Edina, a very rich, nice neighborhood. I was there for six months. I went to visit uh, my family and, um, Ohio, and the, it was in a black, uh, predominantly, predominantly black neighborhood, and the ladies were talking, and they're talking about white people and saying they don't like us, they don't this and they don't that. And I was confused, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I don't know, I, I couldn't understand. I could not understand. And then uh, back in Minnesota, I saw something on, on the news. It was like a crime or something. And then this little child asked their parent and said, are they black? I'm like, why would they be black? <laughs> so all of that now is making sense to me with being here for 20 years after all of that. And Michelle, and uh, I think it's Dr. Akobo that uh, raised that uh, uh, concern, uh, the relationship between Africans and African-Americans. And the division, 
calling for them to come together. And, and I know there is a lot of Africans and African Americans who are uh, together and have a relationship, but then there is a misunderstanding, there is a, a division uh, of, of, of cultural and social and backgrounds that made us not one. But what I tell to the African people that told me, like one, one time I, I made a post on a group of, of uh, in Senegal, a group of women in Senegal that are in Senegal, because I was just wondering, I said, there are people all over the world, Europe and everywhere, um, uh, denouncing what is happening in America, but what about here? I don't hear anything in Senegal or in Africa. Of course, there are a lot of Senegalese who have been um, uh, saddened and um, not happy about it on social media. But then I heard some comments in that group that says, we don't care. The African Americans, the Americans, we don't, they don't care about us, we don't care about it. And that's wrong and in so many ways. Because when I come out on the street or one African man is out walking on the street, the police, the, the, the bad police man who killed George Floyd, he would not care or he would not ask if you're from Africa. He would not ask if you're from Mali or Senegal or are you from North Minneapolis. All what they see is a black guy walking and that's all what it takes to be killed in many cases. And I think many agree with, with me. And to my white friends and the white people who want to be um, not racist and who want to advocate for justice, who want to advocate for help, like Stephanie said, and I think Dr. Bond said that too, it comes from within. It comes from yourself for wanting to do that and meaning it. Don't. Don't don't put it don't put on a face just to, to to go with the flow. Just mean it. If you mean it, it shows in your actions. If you mean it, it shows in your within your words. Don't have a black friend just to say I have a black friend, therefore I am not a racist. No, you a lot of people don't have black friends but they are not okay with what's going on and they want to make a difference because they don't see the people who are oppressed as black. They see a human being who's oppressed and who's being killed for no reason. And that's the key word, seeing a human, human being, not just a color. And like, like uh, those, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Bourne and, and Stephanie said, and also I hear a lot of my friends said, Black people right now are, are the victims. And if somebody is bullied, they're the victim. And I'm in high school or middle school. At least all of the fights that I had when I was in elementary school, they were not my fight. They were the fights of others. Like I see a kid bullying a kid, I will jump in. I don't care how big that person is. I will jump in and be on the side of that kid and help. So if somebody is bullied or somebody is a victim, they are lying down on the floor. They can't defend themselves. Don't expect them to do something. When you're witnessing, do something and say something. Therefore, don't wait for black people to say they have to stand up for themselves. They are trying, but they don't have the power that the white privileged have. The voice of a white person is way stronger than a voice of a black person because they have the privilege. Therefore, they have to come in and help for this to end. And another thing that I wanna say to uh, white, white friends, or sometimes not even white friends, it's just white acquaintance, who come to try to justify the killing of an of a, of a innocent black person by digging out or showing me articles or videos of the person that's killed of their past, of, of the, their, their past crimes. No crime can justify killing somebody in the daylight live. So if 
something like this happens, I don't know George Floyd. He's not related to me, but he's a human being. I am mourning his killing because it hurts me so bad to see somebody being killed like that, no matter who they are. I, if I say that, I try, I try not to cry because I've cried a lot. If he was Asian, i still be crying. If he was white, i will still be crying because it's wrong to do that to a human being. So I am mourning as a human being and I'm mourning as a black person who's worried about my husband, my children, and the children of my neighbors and all of every black man. So if I'm crying and I'm mourning you as my white friend, you can reach out and say, how are you doing? If you really care and say that I see you, I hear you, that's all maybe at that point that I need to hear, but don't run away from me when it's, when it, when it, when it's bad and when it's, when it's horrible. And also, like I said before, the help comes from within, it comes from within the house. If you're in your household, you may not be racist, but you may know somebody who's racist. If you hear them do, do, do racial comments or racial slurs, stop them. Tell them they're wrong. And teach your kids to be better leaders tomorrow. And everybody, please vote. On that note, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope we'll have more of these discussions in the future. Uh, follow uh, Tempo Africa um, TV and for more um, wonderful topics. Thank you so much. It's me again, Korma, Korma Agustak Maya. I'm here today to tell you more about Tempo Africa and how you can contribute. As you know, Tempo Africa is a station that services people of African descent and people in America, people in Africa, it's all over the globe. And for us to do that, we are always accepting donations. To donate, you can go to the website at tempoafrictv.com and then you click on the home page and then click on PayPal donation and you can make your donation there. You could also call in and make a donation. The number is 612-804-0295. I cannot tell you how grateful we are for your donation. Please take the time and check out the website and feel free to donate to this wonderful service that Tempo Afrique continues to offer us abroad and at home. All this information is on the website. Just go to tempoafriquetv.com and you will get more information. Thank you very much. C'est encore Yves Kenao, c'est toujours Yves Kenao qui nous vient. Cette fois-ci, pour vous dire que Tempo Afrique TV vous offre plus de 4000 chaînes de télévision. Les chaînes européennes, les chaînes américaines, les chaînes asiatiques, les chaînes...